Many of you know I'm a true advocate for taking supplementation to optimize your health, and one of the best things you can do is choose the right collagen. Collagen is a building block to your entire body. I was introduced to Sparkle Wellness product Skin Boost Plus about a year ago, and I've been taking it ever since. Now, they've launched a new bone strength product that I'm super excited about. New Osteo Boost Collagen is formulated to improve bone mineral density, something we all need to think about as early as age 40. Made with award-winning collagen peptide known as Fortibone, the product really has led to meaningful results for people who need significant improvement in this area, including those suffering with fractures or broken bones. Osteo Boost is a great choice for anyone over the age of 40 to reduce the risk of bone mineral density loss, a major precursor to the diagnosis of bone-related diseases. Right now, you can get any of the Sparkle Wellness Collagen Supplements from Amazon or from their website, lovesparkle.life, and use my code DRFIT for 20% off. That's D-R-F-I-T at lovesparkle.life for 20% off their new product, Osteo Boost. to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It's so wonderful to have you here today. I cannot wait to introduce you to today's guest, and we have so many incredible things to talk about on the podcast. Dr. Guy Citrin dedicates his time and expertise to helping men and women improve their general health and quality of life at his private practice in Beverly Hills, California. Dr. Guy combines innovative, integrative modalities with functional naturopathic and conventional medicine for the best possible results. He has diverse experience, education, training, and specializes in treating gut dysfunction and hormone imbalance and a host of other chronic diseases. The center where he works utilizes the most up-to-date anti-aging regenerative techniques for optimal outcomes. Dr. Guy received his naturopathic medical degree from the National University of Health Sciences He was a resident at a renowned affiliate site through Bastyr University before he relocated to Los Angeles. He is a member of the Endocrinology Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the California Naturopathic Doctors Association, and a nationally recognized speaker on the microbiome for Microbiome Labs. Dr. Citroen, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thank you so much. So good to be here. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your background and your path to doing what you do now, like wh- why these areas of, of expertise? So yeah, I, actually it's funny. No, not a lot of people ask me that. Um, I feel like everybody always has like a personal story that just yeah. kind of like catapulted them on this like yeah. divine pathway. No, it's actually insane. Like the, the coincidences that aligned for me to be here are out of control. So Um, It starts with a sad story. My best friend passed away from cancer when I was 19. And at her funeral, I met her holistic doctor who takes me aside for whatever reason and goes, I need to treat you. And I was like, I was a pretty healthy kid. I was like, why? I was like, he's like, I just, I have to treat you. So he treats me and he works out like a deal with my, because we were like, we didn't have any money. And my mom was like, I'm not paying for this. So he works out like a deal with my mom on like some commercial thing and he treats me for two years and changes my life. And he was a holistic chiropractor and him and his partner, um, his partner ended up being the founder of Microbiome Labs, uh, Megaspore Probiotic. So Tom, Dr. Tom Bain, who's been my personal mentor now for like 20 something years and um, has just really helped like every path that I kind of went on. It took me 10 years to kind of get into medicine. And then I tried everything, acupuncture, chiropractic. Uh, I did not go the conventional medical route, but I, then I kind of found my niche in naturopathic medicine, fell in love with it, um, did my residency. And then after residency, Tom basically hired me to speak on the microbiome. And I worked with him and his research team for years and did speaking for them all over the, all over the country. Um, and really became specialized in, in the microbiome. And probably the reason is, is because I find that if you help heal somebody's gut, most of their problems go away. So um, that and hormones, I find that like, if you optimize hormones and you optimize gut in that combination, um, 
it's it's incredible. I usually get 80 to 90% resolution in most symptoms, chronic disease, everything from chronic disease to made, you know, to minor symptoms. So um, that's really why I specialize in it. And then I've I've learned a whole host of like regenerative techniques to optimize health because I live in Beverly Hills and everybody wants to be then, <laughs> once you feel good, there's then what's the next level? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, I don't have any symptoms. How do I Superman? You know? So yeah. or if you're like, yeah. if I'm gonna live to be 150, that's great. Right. I'd still like to look right. 40. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So it's vanity and then and then health following shortly after. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> so. I bet. Okay. So let's talk about the microbiome. It's like, sure. like the hot new word, right? Everybody's talking about the bacteria in our gut and, and all these different things. So I can't wait to dive into this. So talk to me about, I mean, I think when people think microbiome, they think of just the gut, but really we have bacteria everywhere, Yeah. but I guess talk about the function of the gut and this so-called microbiome, like explain it for people. So they, they know what it really does. Yeah. So my, all microbiome is, as you know, is just a collection of bacteria and an opening, right? So if you have like your oral cavity, you have an oral microbiome, you have a vaginal microbiome, you have your small intestine and your colon, right? So like anything that's has a little bit of the outside world before it, it comes into like, you know, our protective mechanisms inside that space has its, a host of bacteria. And those bacteria are very specialized for the location of wherever that is in the body. And then those bacteria do very specific things. And what we're finding out now is through the microbiome research project, which caught, you know, the NIH did for a couple billion dollars, they're finding that there's physiological consequences in all the different types of bacteria we have, more so than our DNA. So originally we thought like DNA was the ultimate, right? As like the end all and be all. If you want to treat disease, you treat DNA. And then did this huge DNA research. They went down DNA for years. And they found that, okay, there's only a couple percentage of diseases that are actually 100% related to DNA improper sequencing. But now we're finding that like, you know, 90 something percent of disease and markers can be regulated and controlled through the microbiome. So um, it is the powerhouse of, or like the root of everything, in my opinion. Um, and when you optimize the microbiome, you optimize the body. So it's like, it's like the boss that's in charge, <laughs> like yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've seen in some of your posts, like you talk about this microbial endocrine system. So yeah. talk about like what these bacteria actually do, or maybe even call out some of like the good players or bad players that we're talking about here. Yeah. So, so like all bacteria, when you have too much or too little, it's problematic. Right. So there is a homeostasis or an equal of all the different types of bacteria in the body. When things are symbiotic, meaning that there's a like they survive through us and then we survive through them. Um, right. When there's like a little bit of that symbiotic play and things are in line in proper numbers, then we're healthy. When certain bacteria become pathogenic or disease causing is when they elevate in numbers that they shouldn't have that much. Um, and then there's all sorts of bacteria that do a whole host of numerous things. So the microbial endocrine system, what that means is, so for a very, very long time, we thought, um, well, endocrinologists thought specifically that most hormones are regulated through glands in the body. So the pancreas, the adrenal glands, the ovaries, the testes, right? These were considered the primary centers of your hormones. And what we found is there's actually bacteria that release hormones as well, which is wild. There's a whole host of bacteria that release hormones, um, potentially even up to 50% of what the body creates as hormonal dysfunction or hormone production, excuse me. So the body can create up to 50% of its hormones through its microbiome, which is insane if you talk to old school endocrinologists. Like that understanding is very, very recent. And when I explain, when I lecture at conferences, that that's always the one that gets all the doctors like, wow, okay, we didn't realize that the microbiome had such a play on hormones. And then the other thing is the hormones metabolize, sorry, the microbiome metabolizes hormones, meaning it breaks down hormones into its various components, which makes those active. So you need what are called the metabolites of hormones to be the active form of hormones. Um, so the microbiome plays very intricately 
with hormone, hormone production, hormone utilization, breakdown of hormones. And so that system is called the microbial endocrine system. When you say hormones, are you talking about sex hormones? Which yeah. hormones are we All like talking about? All of them. Everything from dopamine, leptin, ghrelin, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and then onto the neurotransmitters as well, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, um, all of those cortisol specifically is a big one too. So all of those, um, all the cascade of most of the hormones in the body are either regulated, controlled, metabolized, or utilized by the microbiome. And that is um, becoming a new body system which nobody's really talking about yet. And that's called the microbial endocrine system, which is, wow, we need to optimize the microbiome in the gut to optimize our hormones. And in my clinical experience, nobody feels good until their hormones are optimized. So that is why, like you asked me why I do this is because it's not like a passion of mine to necessarily delve into microbiome or hormones. It's really for the patient. I became a doctor to help people. So how do I best help people is by what I have found to like figure out the root dysfunction that they're, you know, the, the reason why they're feeling poorly and then optimize those systems. So they walk out of my office feeling amazing. Yeah. And then, and then it's that core, that combination that's really powerful. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about things that impact it. So let's talk about diet, something we do multiple times a day. Yeah. Talk to us about how the food we eat could impact this microbiome for better or for worse. Yeah, so this is also fascinating for most people um, is before you even get to food, you need to understand what bacteria does to food. So, and this is what, this is also kind of missing a little bit in the public knowledge is when you eat your food, you're supposed to, so, so there's a couple systems at play and, and this is normally where I find major dysfunction with my patients. First of all, you have three organ systems responsible for digesting your food. You have your gallbladder, your pancreas, and your stomach. And all of those release digestive enzymes and gastric juice and bile to break down the components of all of your food. So that's your fats, your starches, and your proteins, right? So you have three organ systems, three components of your food. It's a beautiful system. What happens is those systems get sluggish, specifically with stress. That's the major, right? That's the major upregulator to shut down your ability to digest foods. And when you are in a stressful state, your nervous system basically shuts down its production of those gastric fluids, and you stop breaking down your, your food properly. So what happens is, and this is like in 90 something percent of my patients, maybe just because I specialize in gut dysfunction, but I see this so often. What happens is bloating is like probably the number one major symptom, right? So what happens when people bloat is that their food is bypassing their stomach, not fully digested. And then it's the bacteria that then consume the food. They're like fermenters, they eat the food and then they release gas. And that's what causes gas and bloating. So there's a lot of problems in that system that can go wrong. You can stop creating the right amount of gastric juices or your microbiome the type of bacteria that start eating the food can be problematic. And if you're eating more and more types of bad food, like starches, specifically sugars and starch, those will elevate bad types of bacteria. So you can have everything from fungal overgrowth to certain strains of bacteria that start to like, they're called methanobractors, or, I mean, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of bacteria, so I won't list them all, but there's a bunch of bacteria as well as um, fungus that start eating sugars and starches. And then that can create a whole host of other problems in the gut, further shut down the production of gastric juices or start creating irregularities in the microbiome and then your hormones. So to narrow it down to the cause is kind of what I've been specializing in is figuring out like what piece of the gastric system is off why is it off? And then fixing that and then kind of replenishing the microbiome if I can, and then incorporating a better diet. So in terms of what you asked for me, I know it's a complicated answer is the diet is so important because it will, you're basically potentially feeding the wrong types of bacteria if you're eating improperly. And then that has a whole host of problems. How does somebody determine like what that is? Like, is it just whole foods? Is it 
specific to maybe like what bacteria is already there or what you're trying to fix or? So that's really complicated. That's, you know, I spend a lot of hours, you know, and it's, it's individualized with each patient. And this is kind of where I don't have an easy answer for that because it's very patient specific, right? Like certain people may not be able to tolerate any foods. So this will even, this will probably, this is, this is also a little bit unknown too. So I'm going to go into, have you heard of like endotoxemia for mm -hmm. instance? Yeah. Okay. So microbial endotoxemia. So so for the, for listeners who may have not heard about this, it's a very fancy word. It's called microbial endotoxemia. And what it means is when you eat your bacteria, because they don't survive a long time, just their lifespan is very short, they die and they turn over, right? So you have trillions of bacteria. They live, I don't know, a couple of days, a couple of hours, a couple of weeks, potentially depending on the species, and they die. So as they die and replicate, they release a toxin called LPS. And then that toxin can de can create a whole host of problems, including the intolerance to, mo to many foods. So just eating alone causes this, what's called microbial turnover or cellular turnover in your microbiome. And I know this is very heavy on the science, but essentially like What's happening is that your body is getting inundated with this very toxic element just from this bacterial death. It doesn't have potentially a protective lining and that's what leaky gut is. And so you get this, you get this inflammation and it's food driven, but it's not, it, and it can be an intolerance to all the foods you eat or some of the foods you eat. So to narrow down exactly like why that's all happening as well and what foods you can and cannot tolerate. I look at it very specific and individualized for the patient. And I don't, um, I don't have like a, like a cheat code. What I can like the, the, you know, if people don't have the ability to see a doctor like me or see, or do the proper testing and that kind of stuff, usually what I say is it's the quick forms of carbohydrates and the sugars that are the, and gluten that are the big ones. Those three, if you had to eliminate, will probably reduce a lot of your symptoms. So you're saying there's people that maybe should do like fasting or like you're saying like not eat for a period of time? No, it's not that, right? Because the problem is, is if you're eating and you're having intolerances, you have to figure out why you're having intolerances. So what part of your colon or gastric system or microbiome is off that's causing your inability to break down foods properly, mm -hmm. right? And so fixing the cause is the most important thing, you know, and then, and then, and that's why, you know, I recommend doing the right testing to figure out what's going on with the microbiome, what's going on with the organs that are responsible for digesting foods, and do you have a dysfunction in any of those organs or in the microbiome that potentially are causing food intolerances and inability to digest foods properly and also lay down a proper like mucosal barrier or a, a gut lining. And so all of those components together are the major reasons why, in my opinion, people have gut issues. Uh, what do you feel is the best way to test the microbiome? Um, so microbiome labs has the most beautiful, in my opinion, the most, the most accurate test for um, the microbiome itself. Um, but they have a little bit of a limitation with that test and they don't test digestive markers. And for me, I find both of them incredibly valuable. So there is, I'm not a big fan of like, the old microbiome tests, like probably going to get blacklisted for saying this, but like GI, <laughs> like map. GI map, I mean, yeah. I'll just, yeah, like GI map or I'm not yeah. a fan of because of the technology that they use to map out their microbiome is a little old. It's called PCR technology and you can't do PCR technology um, to map out your microbiome. Apparently it's not very accurate. So you need to do what's called whole DNA or partial DNA sequencing. Um, Microbiome Labs is the only lab company I know that does full DNA. Vibrant Labs is the next test that I use to do digestive markers and it's partial DNA sequencing. So it's going to be 70 to 80% accuracy, which is good enough for me to understand what's going on. But I also look at the digestive markers, which are valuable. So like, do they have lipid? Do they have a lot of fat content in their stool? 
You know, do they have any, how's their enzyme production overall? Do they, are they finding meat fibers in their stool? Because all of those indicate, excuse me, all of those indicate like which type of organ system might be off in the digestive process. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, talk to me about like exercise. What impact does something like that have on the microbiome or does it? Oh yeah. Massive. Um, uh, exercise has an incredible impact on the microbiome. You need blood flow everywhere. It regulates a lot of the, um, all the anxiety chemicals, right? So like majorly with cortisol, we want to utilize our cortisol as best we can. We want to recycle cortisol, produce cortisol. That, that's very important with how the gut bacteria are also very sensitive to anxiety chemicals, norepinephrine, adrenaline, um, cortisol. Um, and then so the more blood supply you have, the better you're producing hormones across the board and the better you're utilizing. And then uh, and the, the better blood is going everywhere and kind of neutralizing your nervous system so that you're not in this fight flight place that you're, you know, it kind of breaks you out of, you know, this fight flight perspective, which is really problematic for the microbiome and the digestive markers, the digestive system. So, um, yeah, I think it's incredibly valuable. Probably the most valuable thing we can do is eliminate sugar, gluten and exercise. Yeah. I mean, there's literally besides time, your time and energy, there's there's really no downside to exercise. It's like, there's no other, there's no con. you guys. Yeah. There's no con. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I, like being sore. I don't know if you like being sore, but I like, I love the feeling. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, yeah, no, I think that there's, it's so funny. We just went on this totally off topic. We just went on this Disney cruise with my children and uh, we were on the eighth deck of the ship and like a lot of the entertainment, like the kids club, you know, things like around like the first and second floor. And my followers, one of my like hashtags is always take the stairs. It's just something so easy and simple, right? Just like, don't take the elevator constantly. It's just more movement. So my kids know, like most of the time we avoid the elevator. So constantly on this cruise ship, we're like from the first floor to the 10th floor. And my little, my little seven-year-old, like in her Disney princess dress is just stair after stair we're going from the first floor to the eighth floor and she's just like and she's she's catching up with her she's like short of breath and we get to the we get to the deck that we're going to and she's walking along and she's like I mean that hurt she's like but now I feel really good she's like wow I like I'm feeling really good and I'm like see it's like yeah. there's glory in the pain yeah I don't do that I, I'm on the seventh floor in my office building and I don't take the stairs. Oh yeah. my gosh. Guy, I'm going to start, I'm going to start tagging you in every okay. single staircase story. I'm on to you. I'm okay. on to you. Okay. All right. Uh, let's talk about stress. Like, um, what is, what does stress do and how can we deal with it to positively impact the microbiome? Yeah. So I said stress is the biggest killer that's been known in the medical literature forever. Um, stress creates inflammation ultimately, right? And inflammation breaks the body's systems down. So we want to do everything we can do to ease up stress. I mean, it, it literally will stop you from making enough, as I mentioned, gastric juice so that you're now eating and then most people that are stressed also, they don't eat properly. So I was just on a doctor. I don't know if you know, Dr. Gonzalez, I was just on his podcast and we went into like 15 minutes of just what mindful eating, how valuable mindful eating is mm. because what happens when you chew Tell your us food, what you mean when you say mindful eating, just, just like sitting down and chewing thoroughly, like chewing granularly so that your food is broken down. That is the point. So we want to eat as thoroughly as possible and, and give our body the least amount of work it needs to have to break down massive pieces of food. Mm. So also really important. And I've had, I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen with gut issues that I'm like, your first homework assignment for the first two weeks is just eat mindfully. I'm not even going to give you supplements. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to do anything additionally. I want you to eat mindfully for two weeks. Give me two weeks of eating mindfully. And there's such a massive report of symptoms in, like improving just from that. So just sitting down and just not being in a stressful state when you eat your food, really being in a relaxed environment 
will break down your food. It'll cause you to make more sap saliva, which breaks down starches and signals to your stomach to make more hydrochloric acid. And that starts the digestive process. So one of the things that we do when we're stressed is we eat too rapidly, very damaging. The other thing that happens is that we shift our nervous system to a fight flight perspective, which um, I literally launched a ketamine part of my clinic to address. Um, but one of the things that I really want to help people get out of is this constant fight flight. And again, I'm, my clinic's in Beverly Hills. LA is, you know, I thought it was going to be like, oh, palm trees, everybody's relaxed. This is not a relaxed environment. <laughs> This is super stressed out. I came from Montana. Everybody in Montana is, is chill. Oh my God, I love Montana. That's where my mom's yeah. family's from. Yeah. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I did my residency there. And I, you know, I came to drive. I remember like I drove my car from Montana to LA and everybody here is a psycho on the road. And I was like, whoa, like the stress that you guys are all inducing on yourselves driving this way, like constant road rage right or like so everybody's super stressed out here it's crazy and so and and driving is a big factor of that so um yeah i don't know you know if you live in a big city maybe if you live in a small town it's a little bit different but in a big city there's a lot of stress going on all the time and what that does is it puts your body into what's called fight flight and so you are literally nervous system like running away from a bear that's and so that shuts down your gastric system and your ability to, to absorb foods properly and then creates and then wreaks havoc on the microbiome. So fascinating. Fascinating. Um, okay. Then the next one, the big one, sleep, how does sleep affect our microbiome? Um, how does sleep affect the microbiome? Or does it? it? Yeah. I mean, sleep is going to affect everything. I, you know, I, Again, you know, it's funny, people pay me a whole, a lot of money to basically tell them, eat right, exercise, sleep better, right? Like, ultimately, at the end, it's not that complicated. Um, it becomes super complicated when our sleep patterns get disrupted, when our microbiome gets super disrupted, and then over years of dysfunction, how to correct all that is problematic. But those, you know, those are the pillars of our health, like, you need to hydrate, you need to eat right, you need to exercise, you need to sleep, right? You need a little bit of time, downtime for relaxation. So um, sleep is it, like one of the most important things. I can't get somebody feeling amazing if they're constantly, you know, sleep deprived and fatigued. Um, how that affects the microbiome, I've never really been asked that. Um, off the top of my head, it's probably, you know, a cortisol dysfunction. So as we poorly sleep, um, we don't regulate our cortisol, which is the thing that causes us in our melatonin production. So as we sleep, you know, improperly, we dysregulate our stress chemicals, mm -hmm. um, which are going to further our inability to heal. And how that plays with the microbiome is probably the same that any stress or anything else causes a microbiome is wreaks, probably wreaks havoc on it. Yeah. I mean, it totally makes sense. Just their circadian biology and, and, yeah. um, yeah, our body likes to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. We're constantly messing with it, especially because we just had daylight savings time. Which somebody yeah. told me, was it really the last daylight savings time? Somebody said they made a, a new law or something that it's done. I hope that's I true. Hope, I really hope that's true. I hope to God. I hate daylight please, savings. Please, Jesus. Okay. Um, a huge question I get asked about all the time, pre and probiotics. I guess let's let's define like what those are first for people listening if they don't understand the difference. Yeah. So prebiotic is going to be any food that feeds your microbiome right? So there's a lot of prebiotic foods, but typically the major ones that we think of that are healthy, right, are going to be things like fermented foods, right? That's the big one. So that's going to be cultures, yogurt culture, or kimchi, you know, that kind of stuff. Any ferment, any fermentation that hits a type of food um, changes the structure of that food. And then that food can feed our microbiome. A big one that most people don't know about that I love is something called resistant starch. Resistant starch is amazing for the microbiome. There are companies out there now that are putting a lot of money into 
educating the public on a resistant starch. Resistant starch is very, very cool when you look at it. Um, it it's a really healthy prebiotic. Um, so probiotics are fascinating because I don't love probiotics most of the time. And this is why. First of all, the concept of reseeding your gut is nearly impossible, also a little bit stupid. So you cannot, we don't know yet what you, the fingerprint of your microbiome needs to be look to look like. <clears throat> so that's a very important that is very important to understand is there are trillions of bacteria. We don't know what levels we're like in the dark ages when it comes to the microbiome still. So we can't look at somebody's entire microbiome and say, you for sure need more lactobacillus or you need more bifidobacteria or more acromancia. Like we don't really ultimately know, again, that fingerprint of what things should be at. But we do know when things are at certain levels, they become problematic or pathogenic. So if somebody was raised their entire life and their entire microbiome never had lactobacillus in it, if that was missing, me introducing lactobacillus is not the smartest thing to do for that patient because their body might not be able to tolerate lactobacillus. Mm. Also very important, and this is, is, is that you cannot take live bacteria and do something called inoculation, meaning you can't put this live bacteria, this probiotic, put it in your gut and have it thrive as a bacteria. It gets killed through the, your stomach acid. So the bacteria that you eat, which is a probiotic, and this is in the conventional world, is I need more of this type of bacteria, right? There's 50 billion strains of this bacteria. I need more. It's impossible. You can't take this bacteria that's living in an oxygen environment in, day, in, in room temperature, put it through a cauldron of acid, and the, and the gut is, is mostly nitrogen. So you can't have this oxygen species go through this acidic, hot environment, come out the other end not killed, and even if it somehow survived, then breathe nitrogen and survive. So, so the concept of taking probiotics to reseed what you're lacking is, like I said, a little stupid, a little mm -hmm. antiquated, um, just, you know, and there's a lot of companies that do bad marketing because they know this and they still feed, you know, you need healthy bacteria in your gut. Well, you're yeah. not getting, you're not reseeding your gut. Basically it's not happening. So. Yeah. I have patients all the time that are like, yeah, I was having some gut problems and I started taking this probiotic. It's so much better now. <laughs> I'm like, well, placebo effect is 50%. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's not, that's not, um, that's still possible, but why is that possible, right? So what is the benefit of taking a probiotic? So conceptually, right, you're not reseeding your gut. So that, that theory is out the window. But what you're doing when you're eating a probiotic, a live organism, is you're breaking down into its cell fragments, and those cell fragments are immune modulating. So mm -hmm. they will alter the pH of your gut. They will also change the immune cascade. So you have this whole cytokine inflammatory issue that happens when you take probiotics, you can alter your immune responses by taking, which in the immune, the immune um, response inflammation is the thing that causes irritation, pain, disruption. So I'm not saying that probiotics don't have benefit to them, but what they're doing is not what we intended them to do. So that's a big distinction. And then furthermore, which probiotics do you need to create that immune modulating effect? Or ultimately, that's also um, potentially just a band-aid to it, right? So why is our microbiome off is more of the importance. What is going on with our microbiome that we need to rehab and rehabilitate that system for it to optimize itself rather than for us to give band-aids all the time for it to feel better? So, um, so probiotics have their place in symptom management. In my experience, they don't have a lot of, um, they don't have a lot of cure. I find mo mostly the cure mo more in prebiotics because prebiotics are going to feed your healthy bacteria to optimize. So I like prebiotics. Um, the type of probiotic I like are called spores. 
spores are a big deal in the now everybody's going to start hearing about spores spores are the way that we pass probiotics from animal to animal they are only nitrogen dependent they they encapsulate themselves in oxygen and they can they're strong enough to bypass the hydrochloric acid layer so mm -hmm. You can bypass the stomach. They unravel. They live in the gut for about a month. They do all sorts of beneficial things. And then you excrete them. Um, and so they're fascinating little creatures. Uh, and it's how animals have been passing strains. They're, I mean, they're hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old. And it's how all animals basically pass through soil content. That's why soil organisms are so popular or have gained a lot of attention is because those are the things in soil that create benefit. That's how animals heal e like gut their guts through eating soil ultimately. And why soil eating soil is so helpful for us because it has these spores in them. Um, so that's a lot of content. Let your kids eat dirt. Yeah. Um, Let your kids eat dirt. Yeah. Yeah. No, while you were talking, I mean, I'm just, um, when we were talking about, you know, this idea of seeding like taking the probiotic and that it, you know, goes down and starts flourishing in your small intestine or something like that. I'm totally with you with the theory that like it hits this hydrochloric acid and there's no way that it's viable. Then I always think too, as an obstetrician, like how does this bacteria get there and start flourishing in the first place? Because we used to think that the intrauterine environment was sterile and we've realized, I mean, and the research is hard because right, it's, you can't get a placenta out of a woman. <laughs> without it either coming out of C-section or a vagina. So there's always this, you know, is this just microbial contamination from, you know, handling and, and things like that. But we know that the microbiome of, of vaginally delivered babies and C-section babies are very different. Um, so then it makes me think like, is it going through the nasopharynx, but then it still has to travel. Is it going via the vagus nerve? Like how is the bacteria initially populating the small intestine Calculate. and colon yeah. like how, because if that got there then like you would think that you would be able to send something else down the same tube right well so i'm um, just talking out loud <laughs> no, no, no. so this this has been a this has been a big uh, passion of mine to help uh with preconception and conception and so as as i specialize in microbiome i know i actually know a, a fair amount of the initial inoculation of a, of a fetus or of a newborn um, so the thought right now is that lactobacillus primarily is the primary species in the vaginal canal. Um, there are, there are only like four species in the vaginal canal. So for females with a lot of like BV, uh, UTIs, all that kind of stuff, we do, we regulate the pH, which regulates lactobacillus. And we've done oftentimes probiotics of just lacto in that canal, um, which totally rehabilitates the area. So the concept right now is that the baby is sterile with their hydrochloric acid doesn't start for four days. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, the baby's supposed to be sterile for four days after birth. And as it passes through the vagina to be delivered, the bacteria, the lactobacillus and the other host of bacteria inoculate the mouth and then go all the way down the tube and start getting into the gut before the hydrochloric acid system starts. And you basically have four days to inoculate the child. That is why a C-section baby and a non-C-section baby have totally different microbiomes. So there's, there's actually this like, and a lot of people may find this gross. There's a lot of, there's a, this whole body of thinking now that if you're going to have a C-section. Yeah, vaginal seeding. Vaginal seeding. Yeah. Into, the biggest, into the so for people listening, basically what this is, is we take, uh, we take sterile four by four swabs and we place them in the woman's vagina. And then after the baby comes out by a C-section, you can take these swabs and you can rub them in the mouth and in the nose and, and, uh, and places like that. The biggest risk with vaginal seeding is that now, you could argue that the baby was going to come through the vagina, you know, anyway, or whatever, but you can inoculate babies with bad bacteria, you know, E. coli and GBS and things like that. So there's always, you know, risk with doing it. Hmm. Have you found that, have you found a lot of females doing that or any risks that have happened afterwards? We don't, 
we don't like routinely offer it for C-section babies, but I've definitely had patients bring it up preconception. Like, Hey, if I were to need a C-section, you know, do you have a protocol for vaginal seating or is it allowed or what can I do? Or, and I believe our hospital, um, like the protocol basically is we'll, um, you know, put the four by fours in and, but the parents have to basically inoculate themselves, do it themselves. Um, I know there are some companies working on microbial formulations, like for C-section babies, like a wash, not like a wash, but like, yeah, basically like, um, I hate yeah. calling it a wash. Cause that sounds like you're washing something off, but like, uh, I guess, I don't know. We'll call it like a serum or something. <laughs> They're coming up with these like microbial serums and things that, you know, we could use for C-section babies, um, to help establish that. Um, but this is okay. This is fascinating though. What we're talking about here. Okay. So you're saying that basically there's not enough hydrochloric acid production in the first couple of days to allow those bacteria to get down in there and, and populate. babies supposed to be sterile from my understanding, the, the digestive system doesn't start for four days. So the baby's totally sterile. I agree with that. And then the breast milk, you know, we have a lot of IgA and like immunoglobulin production exactly. that's going down there. And yeah. yeah. So, and I heard you also pass lactobacillus through breast milk as well. <laughs> yeah. And a whole host of other bacteria. So, I mean, yeah, the breast milk has its own microbiome essentially. Right. So I was, so, th- so my biggest question for new patients is, were you breastfed and were you a C-section? And if you're a C-section and you were not breastfed, I have to tell you, honestly, those are my sickest patients. Mm-hmm. Always. That is my number one patient. That is my number one question I ask patients is because I'm looking at their microbiome and I'm like, did you have a, did you have the start of a healthy microbiome where you breastfed properly? And we know now like neurological development and so many benefits of breastfeeding, you know, nine months to a year is kind of where the literature is. And, you know, historically there weren't babies without being breastfed. Like that didn't exist in the history of humanity. They died. They just died. Yeah. Like, you know, and so all females breastfed their babies until what, like a hundred until formula basically came out a hundred or 200 years ago. So, um, you know, genetically we're, we're, that's how we've been surviving. That's how our microbiome, that's why our bodies do do what they're doing. So, um, yeah, I don't know where we're going for women. Okay. So for women that have maybe low supply or something like that, are there, I know a lot of the formulas are just garbage. Are there any particular formulas that seem better from a microbial standpoint? Um, or are, is there anything a mom could do if she was low supply or no supply to support the baby's microbiome? So I don't, um, I don't treat, I don't treat, you don't treat kids and babies. Or <laughs> pregnant people. <laughs> I feel like I'm not touching that with a five foot pole. Okay. I can, I can explain <laughs> the science, but, uh, yeah. clinically no idea. Um, <laughs> Maybe if I ever have children of my own, (laughs) I'll get into it. Okay. All right. We'll shift, we'll shift topics. Um, talk to me about dairy. I always hear like, oh, dairy is inflammatory. It's not good for the gut. Like talk to me about dairy and the microbiome. Um, most people are allergic to dairy. Um, I do, I do what's called peptide sequencing, uh, testing on foods. So, um, basically when we're allergic to anything, it's the protein we're allergic to in anything. So the way that I do food intolerance testing is that I use a lab that uh, breaks down the food into all of its various proteins and test those proteins against your immune system. And it'll tell me more accurately if you have an actual food intolerance to something or if your immune system is getting upregulated when it meets that food or that specifically when it's broken down into its peptide or its small amino acid or protein. So when that's happening, what I can tell you is that you know, through the thousands of people that I've already tested now on food intolerances, the majority are allergic to food. I don't have a percentage where you've never calculated, but mostly I see cow's milk is the number one. Most people can tolerate some form of sheep or goat more easily. Um, But cow's milk across the board is like super inflammatory. Do you think it's because it's pasteurized dairy? Like what about raw milk? So actually one of the first ways I got into medicine when that guy was training me is I, I, I did the caveman diet, um, which is raw milk, raw eggs, raw, everything it's raw. It's all your, it's everything is raw from the farm, from a really healthy farm without E. coli. And so, 
and parasites. So I would, I'd eat everything raw, including raw milk and I'm lactose intolerant. Like I can't handle any cow milk at all. Um, and I could drink raw milk, which was really crazy. So I don't know. I know with the pasteurization, also the amount of hormones they pump in, they bleach the milk. I mean, there's so milk is so bad, Mm -hmm. not necessarily because milk is bad, but because of how badly it's made for us. And the, you know, like it goes bad really quickly. Rum goes bad in like two days. Mm -hmm. So for it to sit on the shelves for like a month, you have to do a lot for it to be able to handle that. Um, And none of the stuff that you're adding into milk to do that is going to be healthy for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm usually a big fan of, but it's less of an intolerance than wheat. Wheat and gluten are by far across the board, a, a 10 out of 10 on intolerance for almost every single person I test. Talk to me about all these milk alternatives, oat milk, almond milk. <laughs> I can't even like keep up with all of them that are coming out. What do these things do to the gut for people? I don't know. I haven't studied them enough to be honest with you. I'm not as much. They're just expert. like, it's just like chemical water. It's like carrageenan water. There's like, there's no almonds in your almond milk. Like, come on. Uh, so a lot of people have nut sensitivities. So I find that almond milk like disrupts their gut. Um, you find oat milk, like they're all equally garbage. <laughs> oat milk, I, I haven't looked into as much. I know it's like a huge craze right now. I don't, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it sounds, you know, on paper, it sounds cool, yeah. but like, yeah. it's also oats you're taking oats are not necessarily the best foods for you. Right. Um, so, okay. Okay. So <laughs> I end all of my podcasts with something called the semen analysis, which I normally pull like a cool study or, you know, something that ties back to what we talked about. But today my followers know I just got over a horrible case of salmonella. Um, I have never been that sick in my entire life. So I want to touch on like illnesses like this and antibiotic use and like what should somebody do if they get really sick, um, or have to go on a course of antibiotics, like talk to us about gut restoration after something like that. Yeah. Basically. Basically help me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of my most, uh, one of the most intriguing clinical diagnoses I make is, a, um, illness, post food and into- f- post food poisoning. Hmm. And um, I just lectured at the, I don't know if you're familiar with PMLI, um, the Jeffrey Bland Functional Medicine Conference. Okay. So uh, they just had me on stage talking about H. pylori and autoimmune disease. So um, there is massive, massive correlation between food poisoning, things like salmonella, E. coli, H. pylori, you know, what have you, and the onset of autoimmune disease, not to scare you. But the onset of autoimmune disease, and because it upregulates your inflammatory cascade. So basically what happens is these microbes come in and they they create this crazy amount of inflammation. And then they cellular mimic some of our inflammatory processes, which causes our body to get super confused and start attacking ourselves. And we can onset with autoimmune disease. I cannot tell you how many people I have seen significantly sick post one case of food poisoning, and then potentially sometimes antibiotics or not antibiotics. And I have to undo that entire process, which can take a little bit of time, time consuming. So one of my favorite, my favorite remedies is called IgG, immunoglobulin G. It is a binder of toxins. So whenever you have a food poisoning, it will release this crazy amount of toxins in your gut. And that is the thing that causes this inflammation. IgG will bind those toxins. So I'm a massive fan of if you get food IV poisoning, IgG or how do you get no, it? No, no, no. Oral. Oral IgG. Yeah. But like tons of it. I pop those things like candy if I get food poisoning. So you want to you neutralize- guys know what I'll be doing after this podcast. <laughs> So SBI Protect is one from Orthomolecular or a Microbiome Labs has a beautiful product called Mega IgG. Um, Mega IgG is probably, yes, the one I use just out of loyalty for the company, but um, any IgG product um, is going to neutralize your endotoxemia 
pathways that food poisoning can cause. So one, it's very important to keep a bottle of that in the house. In my opinion, you always want to keep a bottle of IgG. You get food poisoning. It will shut down your hydrochloric acid system. It'll create ammonia, wreak havoc, create this endotoxemia. Things like salmonella can get potentially dangerous if they can cause sepsis, that kind of stuff. So what you want to do is you want to neutralize it first. So antibiotics are important, but you want to neutralize everything. So taking a ton of IgG with any antibiotic is always my preference. Um, probiotics, I usually do. There was a huge, um, there's a lot of contraindications on whether to take probiotics with antibiotics. Um, the thinking right now in the conventional world is you do not take probiotics with antibiotics, but I am a fan of taking spore probiotics with antibiotics and post that. So um, again, this kind of stuff, you want to talk to your clinician, right? This is not medical advice. I just want to be super yeah. clear. Like you really want to talk to somebody who kind of knows your gut. If you have a gut doctor, you should probably get one. Um, but somebody who kind of understands your gut and then can help you with that stuff. But mega IgG is always really, really good to take. And then you want to want to like activate a charcoal even. You want to just bind as much as possible, right? You want to neutralize you want to neutralize this bug and bind any havoc that it can create as it's bypassing through your gut and creating this havoc. And then if you need antibiotics, usually I give spores depending on the person's gut um, and just flushing, right? Drinking tons of water, not feeding any other fungal. So it's like no sugar, right? Super yeah. clean diet, just soft food. I couldn't eat for an entire week. <laughs> really? okay. Are you okay? <laughs> are you, are you okay now? I, no, I actually am. I, um, no, I, it was one, you know, it's one of those things where you just, I thought it was just going to resolve, right? Like I've never, I just have never experienced something like that. So I just thought just like any time before, like, oh, I ate something bad. It's going to be like 24 hours and I'll be fine tomorrow. But, um, no, but actually <laughs> the night that it happens, like the night I got obviously inoculated, like 105 degree fever. It was no, like whatever. nothing like I'd ever seen before, but I just thought it was going to go away. But thankfully I, um, I took my poop in a bucket and <laughs> thankfully for PCR testing, I found out it was salmonella. Okay. Um, but I, I didn't improve until I took antibiotics. So, um, thankfully, yeah, so you need anti yeah, you need thankfully we have Western medicine. Now I but would do, yeah. I would do all the like MSM, aloe, yeah. you want to calm down the inflammation a bit, right. You want to reduce the inflammation you know, the mucosal strains, the prebiotics, the IgG, I would just throw a whole host of that in for like a week, right? Just make sure everything neutralizes and calms, bowels return back to normal, all that stuff. Yeah. And then I would just help with the mucosal barrier for about a week. I'm down, I'm down with it. And I 10 out of 10 don't recommend salmonella, you guys. Oh my Lord. It was, it was uh, fun. Yeah. It was I'm glad I, you're better. I'm glad you're better now. And now I've had people like they're messaging me. They're like, Oh my God, I had it too. It's like the worst thing ever. So God bless anybody that's experienced that. That is like, on another, now there's a listeria outbreak, I think running around too. So oh, we're going to see, I'm not gonna see gonna all sorts of, gonna see, you're going to have a lot more patience here soon. <laughs> Okay. Tell people yeah. how they can find you, how they can follow you. Maybe they want to come into Beverly Hills and be your patient. Yeah. Um, so citrinwellness.com, C-I-T-R-I-N, uh, citrinwellness.com. We just launched a whole new website. So there's a lot more information on it. And then my Instagram is going to be changed soon, but it's, uh, it's ask Dr. Guy, A-S-K-D-R-G-U-Y. Um, and I do a little bit of social media stuff, but we are migrating to Citroen Wellness soon because I just hired an associate and we're expanding and I've been super lazy on my own marketing and <laughs> <laughs> we're doctors, not marketers. I know it's yeah, I'm like yeah. I'm trading all day. It's hard to find the time, but yeah. um that's why I love doing podcasts and this kind of stuff because it, you know, I get to talk more. Yeah, and we didn't even get to talk about it, but like you do microbiome testing, hormone optimization, regenerative medicine, and you kind of touched on you're starting to do some ketamine stuff. Yeah. So we opened up a ketamine part of the clinic. Now we're doing a lot of ketamine therapy, which has been really incredible. And I find that when I'm working on, I haven't really done it on patients just solely. So I'm really combining it with my current patient base right now. And I'm finding like when I'm optimizing their hormones and their gut and then putting them through a ketamine mental rehab program, we have a therapist on staff, all that stuff. So 
that combination when I can do like mind body, that's truly mind body medicine, in my opinion, and then regenerative stuff, if they can, if they can afford it, because that's pretty expensive. But um, that even just those combinations are like pretty life changing for my patients, honestly. So um, it's been cool. It's been a cool process to watch people heal. Um, I love this. I love this field. I think integrative medicine, functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, whatever you call it is the future of medicine. I'm finding patients resolve and heal and become better and feel better and work through, you know, go through life better and more optimized. And the more we understand yeah. scientifically, the better we can help everyone. So I love it. I love yeah. it. Well, Guy, it's been so fun to have you on today. And thanks everybody for listening. Make sure you share this episode with anybody who would find it helpful. We appreciate you all. And we'll catch you next episode. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.